Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, this is uh, We're coming uh, to you on May 14th, 2020, still in the uh, heart of coronavirus lockdown. Uh, my name is Jason McBee. I'll be your host today. And with me is uh, in your upper right corner is Leon Brathwaite, uh, a retired engineer from the state of California, and uh, Tim Evert, our Screaming Eagle of Freedom uh, pilot in the uh, state of California as well. Um, so uh, it's uh, been it's been interesting. We haven't talked for a few weeks, and and uh, you know it's uh, kind of a surreal world out there with uh, all the lockdown and, and COVID scare. Um, I guess I uh, wanted to talk to you guys right away on on what your experience. I, I, Tim, you know, I'll jump to you right away uh, as a as a pilot. What what kind of stuff are you seeing out there as far as this lockdown is concerned and how that's affecting things? Yeah, um, we've uh, been doing a lot more uh, movement of Uber Eats. At least that's what has been in my plane. So. Uh, uh, and these Uber Eats are, are just small FedEx packages that go uh, all over the the states. You know, they're everywhere. So, um, I mean, you know, all the way to a uh, lot to the East Coast and, and that kind of thing. So I uh, and they come up out of uh, Mexicali and off they go everywhere. So. I'm not really sure what's going on there. I don't really use Uber Eats. And so I'm not. Uh, I'm not privy with their their supply chain, but they've got something going, and we're part of it. And uh, generally, the uh, the loss to the movement of goods inside the uh, bellies of the of the uh, the previous um, long haul uh, flights that had passengers. Apparently, they. Uh, they uh, were responsible for about um, 50% of the movement of uh, goods so uh, by aircraft. So uh, this was shut down, of course, and it had to be um, taken up by, by FedEx, UPS, and other uh, cargo outfits to, uh, to uh, pick up the slack because a lot of that was still being moved. And... And on top of it was that, you know, the, the PPE, the personal prof- protection equipment that uh, the health services needed. So a lot of that was being moved uh, in addition to the to the normal stuff. And I'm, I'm sure there's been a slowdown of the normal stuff. But, you know, people are at home until their money runs out, which is probably getting close here uh, and, and buying stuff. And for... Um, <clears throat> For my situation, I we've been busy throughout the whole thing, fairly busy, and so I'm not sure how long that will go. But uh, again, uh, the uh, the supply chain was picked up by by the the main cargo companies. Huh, that's kind of interesting. You said when well, you said Uber Eats, so Uber Eats is that kind of like uh, 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 food delivery services to people's home? Is that pretty much what? <laughs> Uh, I'm yeah. no expert on, okay. on what it is, but yes. Uh, and um, to be, but apparently to be a part of the Uber Eats uh, circle of life, you uh, have to have to buy the, the food through this whole Uber Eats uh, supply chain. So if you're a restaurant in New York and you're uh, supplying Uber Eats for your customers, then uh, I guess you're getting a little bit of, you're basically a middleman, it sounds like to me, because we've got the pack, they're, they're all nice and packaged, ready to go in the planes. Yeah, because I, you know, I remember hearing about these companies like Grubhub, where you know they're literally taking the food from a restaurant to a person's home, but this right. is kind of a, a bigger leap, it sounds like, <laughs> going yeah. to be applying. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah, I've I've never used Uber Eats, but uh, you know, maybe Leon knows more about it than I do. I, I'm not sure. No, no, I don't actually. I mean, I I've, I've used Uber for um, for transportation services, but in terms of Uber Eats, no, I've I've never um, I've never yeah. used it. And uh, what little I know about it is what I've read in the in, in the newspapers. Mm. Well, so, you know what. Uh, 
Oh, oh, sorry, Tim, did you have something more there? Or? Oh, it's, it's just an example of, you know, in mm -hmm. w when times are, are rough, you know, certain, it, it benefits some companies uh, to the detriment of others. So yeah, kind of how it works, I guess. That's kind of interesting hearing about that from the good side of things. Uh, Leon, you know, you have a little bit of a background in the energy sector. Uh, uh, are you noticing any, any uh, interesting observations from that area? Well, the energy sector, in particular, the, the oil and gas industry, is taking a very serious beating right now. The reason for that, of course, is that we have this enforced lockdown on businesses and people are not demanding energy as much as they did in the past. So take, for instance, natural gas prices, which is one of my areas of, I wouldn't call it expertise, but certainly an area of, that I've studied quite a lot. The natural gas prices over the last year was up around $3 and everybody was, you know, using it and it was, it was a pretty clean burning fuel to use in your, in, in your operations. But now natural gas prices have gone from about $3 and now it's about, I think, $1.70 or something like that. It's all because of the lower demand because of the enforced shutdown. It's all because the government has decided that certain businesses are essential and some are not. It is sort of ridiculous. Now, it is good for consumers in some of these lower prices and some of it, if you go to the gas pump, the other day I went to fill my, fill my car with gasoline and I was paying like $2.25 a gallon. Previously I was, I was up around like three fifty a gallon. So it's good for consumers, but it's not a good thing that is happening in the oil and gas industry because these forced lockdowns are putting pressure, downward pressure on prices and downward pressure on demand, downward pressure on prices, and we're having massive layoffs and massive, of course, people are not working, people are, I mean, a lot of unemployment is presently going on in, in that industry. The one thing that seems to be not too affected by, by the lockdown is the prices of renewable, the so-called renewable energies like wind and solar. But the reason for that is the same government that caused us to shut down most of our economy is subsidizing these these um these industries, the the renewable industry, which is kind of, which is kind of ironic as far as I uh, I'm concerned, but yeah. the the oil and gas industry in particular is really taking a beating right now. Well, I imagine a lot of that's because of the the lockdown creates a a minimization of travel, and probably a lot of these alternative energies sure. are probably not used so much in transport. That's my guess. Well, anyway. it's partly partly true, partly true. But um, but even well, gasoline is is highly losing transport, and that those prices are down quite a lot. People are not as mobile. <coughs> excuse me. People are not as mobile as they were prior, um, pre pre the um, pre the pandemic. So we yeah. are we are seeing lower lower demand for for um, for energy in the transportation sector. So that's why we're seeing these these lower um, um, prices at the pump. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, speaking of, of these uh, issues that we're seeing, I mean, it, it, L.A. just announced that they're going to be uh, holding their lockdown in place through July. So there's apparently, you know, uh, you know, even though it sounds like there's movement around the country to start lifting some of this lockdown, you know, there's a lot of places where they're doubling down on it and going to sure. keep it in place longer. And, uh, Michigan, in fact, uh, Michigan and Maine in particular, yes. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, Gil Garcetti had, had said something in a statement. He said, uh, uh, you know, he says, uh, well, we got to get it right so we don't have to retreat, which kind of makes you wonder if they've got the right strategy anyways. If the idea is that they see this as something of having to retreat from, uh, you know, when you see that Sweden is is going forward with something like this so that they, uh, ho they're hoping to avoid a second wave, whereas it seems kind of like there might be a misunderstanding even to think that you know, when we don't have a a uh, vaccine and we don't have herd immunity, that somehow we stay locked down in a global pandemic, and then we come out and the disease just magically goes away. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but this, you know, this is the whole point about all of this. I'm I'm sorry. Did I cut you off, Jason? I'm no, sorry. no, no. Okay. When 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 will be a good time to reopen? The 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 government. Do they ever get anything right? That they're gonna tell us now? Well, okay, a month from now we'll open, or two months from now we'll open. We don't have a vaccine, as you correctly point out. 
we have some therapeutic drugs that seem to be showing some promise. So at some point in time, we have to open. At some point in time, the risk is going to be there for us to take. The fact of the matter is no government can ever mitigate all risk. So we just have to decide what risk we are willing to take and decide if we're going to go back to some level of economic activity. Now, you know, the, the ironic thing about it is these businesses that have been called essential. You know what happened to those businesses? They figured out how to operate. I go to Costco all the time. Costco figured out how to operate. They didn't know anything about managing transmission prior to the, um, the, the pandemic uh, coming upon us. But yet they have figured it out. So why can't everybody else? What are we so dumb and stupid that we can't figure out how to operate in an economy where we have a risk that we must deal with? This is the whole problem we are seeing right now. It's when government are choosing winners and losers, essential and non-essential. How do you tell a human being that their job, their livelihood, the money that they use to feed their family, to take care of their home, how do you tell them that work is non-essential? I don't understand this. I truly don't. It's well, you know, insulting. It's... Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. When it, it uh, truly bring, begs the question too, what metric are they even using, you know, to figure these things out? I mean, if it's if it's purely safety, then then safety is something that is certainly important to us. But there's there's a lot of other things that are important in life too. And if you're just yeah. going to base all of life on one metric, that seems like you're you're, you're missing an an awful lot. I, you know, it takes me back to uh, Benjamin Franklin's you know famous quotation that you know the person who would uh, trade a little bit of uh, essential liberty for some temporary safety deserves neither, neither. <laughs> I guess. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, you know, and that, that, you know, kind of begs the question too, you know, I mean, if they're thinking this way in terms of COVID, well, there's, there's a lot of other risks out there too. You know, I, I recall hearing from a, a, you know, an economist once, you know, they said, well, you know, I could, I could, drop the, you know, how, how many of you say we can't place a value on life, he would say, and, and nobody raises their hand in the class, and, or, or excuse me, everybody raises their hand in the class. They say, you know, you can't place a value on life. And they said, okay, well, how many of you would be willing to drop the speed limit down to 10 miles an hour if I showed you that we could, you know, reduce deaths by 50,000 a year in this country? And of course, nobody raises their hand. He says, well, there you've done it. You've all just placed a price on life. Yes. <laughs> and so, I mean, and you can see those trade-offs all the time everywhere. And, you know, I don't know if you guys have any observations on that end as well, but it just, you know, it, it just begs the question when a planner is looking and they're only looking at one metric they care about, you know, and maybe they're missing an awful lot of other stuff too that's important. They always do. Central planning, central planning is a disease. That's all it is. It's a disease that they're infecting us with. I mean, think about it, every year on the roads and, and highways and bridges of the United States, we lose about what, 30, 40,000 people every single year. And I just people who die. There are probably another 100,000 who are injured in car accidents. Should we be locking down the economy for that? Should yeah. we? It's a risk. If we have to go to work, it's a risk we have to take. Me sitting here and talking to you guys, there's a risk. Who knows? God forbid. My house could collapse and I could die here, right here in front of you guys. We cannot mitigate all risk. It's ridiculous to even try. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take precautions. Of course, we should, you know, the mask and, and social distancing. And when we come home, we wash our hands. You know, my wife makes me take off my clothes in the garage sometimes if I stay out too long, things like that. Of course, we take the, we, we, we take the necessary precautions. But we cannot mitigate all risk. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I... I think the uh, Supreme Court has just recently made a ruling that may have uh, a big effect on all that. Uh, I can't remember the state. Michigan comes to mind, but uh, just uh, yesterday, and I probably should know this, but uh, the um, the ruling was that uh, this particular state was overstepping their constitutional boundaries by shutting the whole state down. And yeah. so it was ruled unconstitutional. So if that happens in this other state that I can't remember the name of, uh, it'll happen to all states. So all the state sure. governments will be suddenly um, and rightfully handicapped by the Constitution. So um, there you have it. Well, that, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. And, uh, well, 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 Tim, they said handicapped by the Constitution. Well, they should be handicapped by the Constitution because mm -hmm. government should yeah. know their, the government should always know their place. Yeah, Their roles just, should be well-defined and severely restricted, period. 
Yeah, they like to test the, you know, they, they like to throw everything up on the wall and see what sticks, you know. And yeah. so they, they love love testing like a, you know, a, a two year old testing the limits of authority all the time until sure. they they run up against a uh, Supreme Court justice that tells them no. Like it's kind, it's kind of funny too when you say that, that uh, when you uh, couch it that way as uh, them the child and the Supreme Court the parent. In most cases, they get the role of authority and they treat us as children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you talking about the Supreme Court or, or? Oh, I'm just talking about the the government. You know, you said oh, the governments right. are put, testing the limits like children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, we're the we're the parents. We're the ones that fund the entire thing. Every single dime, every nickel, yeah. every penny is comes yeah. from us, except for this this funny money that they've been printing up, and now they're printing up more. In fact, the Fed. I just got an email today that the Fed is uh, admonishing Congress to uh, to continue to uh, you know that that there is severe need amongst us uh, us uh, minions who are told to stay at home now. We're you know what what was it forty percent of the people that make forty thousand a year or less are now unemployed forty percent so. Of these low wage earners, so uh, you know, pump. Basically, what they're saying is um, create the money and just spread it around. So uh, you know, of course, that comes with. I, I don't know. I'm still waiting on the repercussions, and it's just well, you know, amazing to me how much the economy can can soak in in the way of brand new fiat currency coming in, uh, and and still. Uh, not show significant inflation, inflationary pressure, but exactly. uh, I think there. I think like a lot of things, there's a tipping point where it just um, once it reaches that tipping point, that's it. I mean, when there's so much credit creation going on right now, very well, you're, scary. Bringing up, yeah, you're bringing up an interesting area too. Is it? You know, we have uh, multiple la levels of government that are dealing with this. Uh, uh, you know, a strategy for dealing with COVID. We have local, state, and federal. And, and of course, you've just been describing some of the federal government's response. Uh, the states, uh, you know, I mean, are the ones actually pulling the trigger on a lot of these lockdowns and, and shutting down a lot of economic activity. And California, Governor Newsom recently came out and said, okay, we're, we're $54 billion in the hole mm -hmm. on this particular mm -hmm. budget. Uh, yep. And he came out as part of a group of Western states requesting a trillion dollars bailout from the federal government for a, <laughs> for the Western states. So it would. <laughs> Why not? Right. Why? Yeah. What's what's yeah. sure? What's the downside? There is a it's a uh, it's a perpetual motion mach machine they got going at the Eccles building. And so, uh, you know, why not have the Fed just continually print more and more? And they've said they can, the Fed has come out and said, the boys at, and girls at the Eccles building have said that uh, we can do this ad infinitum. It's, there is no limit to that. that they, they really are so pompous and full of themselves. They actually believe this nonsense that you can just continually print money and um, spread it around. And uh, it, it's as if we don't need to actually go out and work all this nonsense about working. We've done since uh, primordial time, uh, you know, this hunting, gathering and uh, farming and eventually industry and create, things and then that creates wealth and you store the wealth and you you know that then after a while you can take some of that and maybe build another business on that and so on and on and on nonsense we just need to stay home and the fed can print money ad infinitum according to them that's it's a very uh <laughs> i just had a i just had a leon moment for a, for a moment there <laughs> Well, we have we have some very good examples in the world of of printing money, of um of printing money and what it does to economies eventually. I mean, yes. um, just before the rise of the um of the of the Third Reich in Germany, yes. just before World War, just before World War Two, 
There's a very good example of that. We can see what happened. And there's a sure. more recent example in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe yes. is the only economy in the world, the only government in the world who ever produced a billion dollar note. One billion dollar note. Billion dollar do you know how much you do you know how much in the US United States and you, you know how much in the in US currency it was worth? It was worth, I think, about six cents or something like that. Six cents. But a one yeah. billion dollar yeah. note. Well, it's it's amazing when the government's making everybody a billionaire that nobody wants yeah. to immigrate exactly. there. <laughs> yeah. What's up with that? What's up with that? <laughs> I got a monopoly game. I can make it pretty well. Yeah, it's it's in my closet at home. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but but this brings up the the point though. In looking at these different levels of government, certainly the federal government can take this route it, it, it certainly we're skeptical highly skeptical that they'll you know it won't have severe ramifications you know for us but it, as far as the state governments go i mean they can't just print money so i mean they are literally dependent upon the federal government bailing them out and if the federal government sends a signal like you just said tim that hey we, we can print as much as we need <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. I, well what signal is there for the states to say hey let's be cautious if, if you know mr moneybags over there yeah. is going to just hand us whatever we need so sure, yeah i mean yeah it, it's uh uh motivating uh so who could blame uh newsom and and the rest of them for for you know for holding their hand out hey uh give me some of that money uh yeah. could blame them uh, and yeah. and they're, they're encouraged to uh which you know again i'm just waiting to see what's going to happen now okay i can be a, a perma bear and continually keep whispering to people that this is going to have ramifications down the line and the ramifications can continue to be staved off by what economic factor I, I cannot fathom because i can't see it obviously because otherwise i wouldn't be a perma bear i'd be saying hey yeah just let's let's join the party you know let's go um and it was the weimar republic for leon uh that he was referring to pre-world war ii in germany the the weimar german republic had that issue with uh Sure. Uh, that's the old wheelbarrows full of cash to go buy a loaf of bread and stone. Yes. That, that we remember. Well, you, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, some of this modern thinking that some people are having that, you know, you can just have governments print money and not, you know, uh, have any of the fundamentals of an economy is kind of, uh, you know, I, I think that the biggest challenge to that was brought up recently in some of these citizens taking a stand against government lockdowns. And one of them was Elon Musk, who, he was on the Joe Rogan show, in fact, and he said, uh, you know, you know, the bottom line is, you know, we, we only have stuff if, uh, you know, if, if we don't work, we don't have stuff, you know, if we don't yeah. make stuff, we don't have stuff. <laughs> it seems oh, like my. such a trivial observation. Yeah. And yet, I can't you know, believe it. I, yeah, I stay home. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's a terrible what insight. Huh? What insight? Yeah. What, that's <laughs> terrible. I'm very disappointed to hear this. But yeah, I, okay, okay, and El, uh, Elon Musk apparently won that fight. The the headlines today is okay. that the uh, the local whatever locale it was they backed down and uh, they gave him special compensation. He can open up his place. Yeah. Well, so you know, my opinion is that if you want to go open up your business, hopefully let it be known to other people in your business that you're open and you hope they open because there's not enough jail space. Even when they pull all the, the rapists and murderers out of the jail and let them go right. so they don't get COVID-19, even at that, there's still not enough space in their jails to jail all the, the thousands and thousands of people that sure. are business owners and that yes. would be uh, taking the place of the rapists and murderers in those right. jails. There's just exactly. not enough room, which is and a I good don't, thing. And I don't think the rapists and murderers are going to come out and start producing f stuff for us either. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I think when we put in these other producers into jail, I, I don't think they're going to fill that void. <laughs> well, you, you, know, but, you, you know, but at the, at, at the end of the day, today. we, we clearly, we clearly have a problem with this, with this, with this COVID with this COVID virus. Yes. But what we are seeing That's right now is that the cure is worse than the disease. That is what is happening. Yeah. 
They're printing money now to say they're going to give us this money. Oh, the central planners is going to give us money so we could stimulate the economy. We're going to stimulate an economy that is not yet functioning because they told us to lock it down. Well, here's yeah, the ridiculous that thing that is going on right now. Sure. But, Leon, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, to, to just uh, push back on that a little bit, too, some of the reason some of these people are standing up is because the government is making promises to give people money, and yet the money is not materializing for some people. So, like this... Sure. Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to remember her name, uh, Shelley Luther in, in Texas, who recently had to face jail and was, you know, uh, pulled, you yes. know, I guess given a pardon by the governor or something uh, there. So she was able to get out. Uh, uh, and uh, there's also um, a uh, uh, there was a Carl Mankey, also a uh, barber. So she was a salon owner. He was a barber and he's in Michigan and he had a militia that was guarding his door so that he could open his barbershop business. The guy's 77 years old. He was, wow. uh, he's in the at risk group and he said, you know, I have never taken charity and, you know, I'm, you know, willing to take precautions and take the risk. And this is, you know, just the way I want to live. And, <laughs> and yeah. you know, he's being told that he can't do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, also the, oh, there's so much stuff going on. And there was the police officer in Seattle who came out, made a video in his uniform uh, and, He's saying, uh, I'm not going to enforce unconstitutional laws and I'm not going right. to lock people up for opening up their business. So uh, then, of course, he's the kudos now, to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now he's on administrative leave and they're oh. pending an investigation. They're thinking about firing him. Well, so both the hairdresser and him have uh, started GoFundMe pages and they're the his uh, is, is way up there. I can't remember what the number was that i saw this morning but it was way up there and hers is like uh off the roof like five hundred thousand or something and so wow. wow so these um these people are um being supported but you know that's not how we can run economies either sure <laughs> i know, you know what, it comes what? as a shock but you know we can't just uh you know, everybody cannot uh, um, go up against the government and create a go GoFundMe page and then live happily ever after. It's just not going to work. But. Sure. You know, we're, right. we're almost out of time, but one okay. quick thing I wanted to jump on real quick, uh, just to get your guys' quick take on this, is uh, uh, CNN today is doing a town hall on, uh, I guess, the uh, health effects of COVID or something. So they're having all these uh, high-level health people. And uh, one of their four panelists, I believe, is Greta Thunberg. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it seems that, you know, I, I didn't know she had a doctorate. I didn't know she was a medical professional. Uh, do you guys uh, have some, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, somebody in marketing won that argument. It's like, okay, we need some, we, we, our viewership is down. I know how to pick it up. Let's have her. It, it doesn't matter what the topic is. They, they just bring her on there and their viewership's going to go up. Oh. Anyway, what do you think? Well, the, the girl the girl is 17 years old and suddenly she has become the new prophet of doom. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's so, running around telling us all about climate change. You don't, uh, speaking of doom, say, though, Leon, sorry, I got to cut you short, but our we've run out of time. Uh, doom okay, has fine. befallen our show. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much, you guys, for uh, uh, participating today. I hope you guys stay safe. And uh, you've been listening to Libertarian Counterpoint, and you can catch us on Public Access, Facebook, just search Libertarian Counterpoint, and uh, we look forward to seeing you the next time.